All right, and welcome to our second video. This time we're going to be looking at module 3.2. We're going to be looking specifically at the periodic table and how it's structured and some of the patterns that we actually can see in it. Again, here we have our learning intentions and success criteria. So if you want to know what the focus of this lesson is, you can go here and check it out. Uh, just ignore the spelling errors that are throughout it. Um, so we want to start off actually looking at the history of the periodic table giving you a bit of an overview of how the periodic table that we we know and love came to be actually um, as it is today now about 2000 years ago there's really only 10 elements that had been identified and you've got sulfur and carbon and iron and copper and zinc tin lead mercury gold and, and silver there and the reason that generally that these ones had actually been identified and, and talked about is because these are the elements that you could find naturally occurring um, as sort of chunks, you know, you can find a gold nugget or a silver nugget in the ground or something like that. Mercury um, is pretty clear. It's mercury and um, sometimes it's called quicksilver um, and that sort of thing. So these are things that you don't really have to do much refining to actually find the elements and to identify them. And there's the sort of things that people had worked with in elemental form for a long time. There's definitely obviously other elements that existed at the time and that people were working with, but they weren't necessarily in elemental form and people didn't realize that these were the sort of base elements that you couldn't get any simpler really than that uh, element itself. Fast forwarding uh, through to the early 1800s and by now we've actually had over 50 elements that have been discovered. You can see uh, I've tried to make a little table there with pictures of all of them. So there's quite a number. If you look at today's periodic table, we've actually got 118 elements. So that would tell us somewhere in the region of 68 elements since then have actually been discovered. Now, uh, a lot of those that have been discovered, discovered is kind of in quotation marks there because there's been quite a number of elements that have actually been synthesized in the lab. So they've not been found by, you know, taking in a sample into the lab and refining it. No, they've actually been found because we uh, took two different types of elements or we took different particles and we put them together and we combined them in a process of like nuclear fusion to create new uh, atomic nuclei and, and as such new elements. So who actually was involved? Well, really what happened is we had lots of different chemists over the years looking for patterns and really looking a way to organize these elements, particularly around the 1800s when you've got over 50 elements that you're trying to keep track of and you want a way to clearly put this information out and some of the key details. So one person that we look at what they did would be uh, John Newlands. Now he took the elements and he arranged them actually in order of increasing atomic weight. So atomic weight is just the idea of basically how much that atom weighs. Now if you remember from the other lesson, an atom's weight comes from its nucleus and basically how many protons and how many neutrons it has. So this is pretty logical. He basically ordered them uh, from lightest to heaviest. And so you can see an example of uh, not John Newland's table, but somebody else's table over here. Now John Newlands does this and he happens to discover that about every eighth element actually shares similar properties. The only thing is it's not the most consistent pattern and chemists end up struggling really to, to come up with that perfect arrangement because of those inconsistencies. So they keep putting them in these different orders, but unfortunately nothing ever seems to work out. It's like the pattern exists and it doesn't exist and it does exist and it's a bit of a pain. Uh, and so they're really quite struggling with it. Um, until in 1869, a gentleman with a wonderful beard and a wonderful name of Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev comes along and he does something. It takes quite a bit of guts uh, at the time. He basically turns around and says, yeah, no, I, I think we're missing stuff. Um, you know, we've got all these elements, but I reckon there's a whole heap that we don't know. And so what he does is he does very similar to what others have been doing. He puts his elements into a table or the elements that they don't belong to him. He puts those elements into a table and the rows are called periods and the columns are called groups. And like John Newlands, uh, Ivanov uh, Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev does it in order of increasing atomic weight. Unlike Newlands and a lot of other chemists and scientists of the time, he leaves gaps. And you can see here this uh, wonderful image of Mendeleev, but then next to it is this table. Uh, that he put together and you can see little dashes all throughout and those dashes are spaces that he's left because he was really thinking gee those I think those patterns um, of repeating properties is really important so we could put the spaces in so that the patterns would be nice and consistent and so he left spaces saying look I think the problem is I think the reason it's inconsistent is this stuff we don't know 
and there's stuff we haven't identified. Um, anyway, I actually have a video here with a little bit more detail about what he did, so I'm going to play that for you now. The periodic table is instantly recognizable. It's not just in every chemistry lab worldwide. It's found on t-shirts, coffee mugs, and shower curtains. But the periodic table isn't just another trendy icon. It's a massive slab of human genius. Up there with the Taj Mahal, the Mona Lisa, and the ice cream sandwich. And the table's creator, Dmitry Mendeleev, is a bona fide science hall of famer. But why? What's so great about him and his table? Is it because he made a comprehensive list of the known elements? Nah, you don't earn a spot in Science Valhalla just for making a list. Besides, Mendeleev was far from the first person to do that. Is it because Mendeleev arranged elements with similar properties together? Not really, that had already been done too. So what was Mendeleev's genius? Let's look at one of the first versions of the periodic table from around 1870. Here we see elements designated by their two-letter symbols arranged in a table. Check out the entry at the third column, fifth row. There's a dash there. From that unassuming placeholder springs the raw brilliance of Mendeleev. That dash is science. By putting that dash there, Dmitri was making a bold statement. He said, and I'm paraphrasing here, y'all haven't discovered this element yet. In the meantime, I'm gonna give it a name. It's one step away from aluminum, so we'll call it Eka aluminum. Eka being Sanskrit for one. Nobody's found Eka aluminum yet, so we don't know anything about it, right? Wrong. Based on where it's located, I can tell you all about it. First of all, an atom of Eka aluminum has an atomic weight of 68, about 68 times heavier than a hydrogen atom. When Eka aluminum is isolated, you'll see it's a solid metal at room temperature. It's shiny, it conducts heat really well, it can be flattened into a sheet, stretched into a wire, but its melting point is low, like freakishly low. Oh, and a cubic centimeter of it will weigh six grams. Mendeleev could predict all of these things simply from where the blank spot was and his understanding of how the elements surrounding it behaved. A few years after this prediction, a French guy named Paul-Emile Lecoq de bois baudrin discovered a new element in ore samples and named it gallium after Gaulle, the historical name for France. Gallium is one step away from aluminum on the periodic table. It's Eka aluminum. So were Mendeleev's predictions right? Gallium's atomic weight is 69.72. A cubic centimeter of it weighs 5.9 grams. It's a solid metal at room temperature, but it melts at a paltry 30 degrees Celsius, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. It melts in your mouth and in your hand. Not only did Mendeleev completely nail gallium, he predicted other elements that were unknown at the time. Scandium, germanium, rhenium. The element he called ecomanganese is now called technetium. Technetium is so rare, it couldn't be isolated until it was synthesized in a cyclotron in 1937, almost 70 years after Dmitri predicted its existence, 30 years after he died. Dmitri died without a Nobel Prize in 1907, but he wound up receiving a much more exclusive honor. In 1955, scientists at UC Berkeley successfully created 17 atoms of a previously undiscovered element. This element filled an empty spot in the periodic table at number 101 and was officially named Mendelevium in 1963. There have been well over 800 Nobel Prize winners, but only 15 scientists have an element named after them. So the next time you stare at a periodic table, whether it's on the wall of a university classroom or on a $5 coffee mug, Dmitry Mendeleev, the architect of the periodic table, will be staring back. So you can see there that uh, Mendeleev was really big in the structure of the periodic table. Um, you might be wondering, why is it called a periodic table? Maybe it's just something that you've always accepted. That's the thing, that shape is that's the periodic table. It's got all the elements in it. But there's actually a reason. Um, the word periodic we often use to mean um, repeated at regular intervals. So you might go to the shops periodically and it might it might mean that you go every sort of week and a half. And it's just another way of saying that um, without defining the time. And so the reason it's called a periodic table is that well, as already mentioned, there's patterns with the properties of the elements. And so each column actually contains elements that have similar chemical properties. So, uh, for example, column one or group one, they all react really violently with water um, in a way that other elements don't necessarily do. So that's a property that they all share. 
And because we see these properties, these um, different properties, physical and chemical things, reoccurring regularly um, and these regular intervals, we say they're reoccurring periodically. And that's actually where we get periodic table from. We're talking about repeating patterns, things that happen again and again, or rather things that happen over a set period of time, things that happen periodically. And so we can sort of talk about periodic law being this idea that when elements are listed in order of increasing atomic weight, the properties of the elements reoccur at regular intervals. That's the guiding um, sort of reasoning behind why we actually call it the periodic table. Now, Mendeleev, in his genius, like I was saying, he left gaps, unlike the other scientists. So he left gaps for undiscovered elements. Uh, the video talked about gallium. I uh, also want to talk about uh, echosilicon. That's what he called it because uh, it was one sort of removed from silicon. And 15 years later, uh, germanium was discovered. Just like gallium, Mendeleev, um, sorry, Mendeleev had made a bunch of predictions about what he called echosilicon about how much it would weigh and the different properties it would have and sure enough 15 years later germanium is discovered and it has uh, those that mass and those properties that Mendeleev predicted which is very very cool um, what's even more impressive is the elements that were properly discovered uh, after he had passed and that sort of thing unfortunately he never got to see them but I'm sure that would have been really uh, satisfying to see them be discovered Unfortunately, by 1925, all naturally occurring elements have actually been found. So any element discovered after 1925 wasn't actually discovered. Rather, it would have been synthesized. Uh, and that's a reasonable number of elements. But most elements um, would have been, I suppose, discovered before this point. So overall, our periodic table looks like this. Now, some people get a bit confused as to the two groups down the bottom. And this is really, it's a big formatting issue. These two groups slot in up here. So you can see the dark pink and the light pink. The dark pink fits in where the dark box is and the light pink fits in where the light uh, pink box is. And what's happened here is if you want to slot those two rows in, you'd be more than welcome to do it. And there are periodic tables you can get out there that do this and they don't have what we call the lanthanides and actinides down the bottom. But the problem is when you do that, you get a very wide and um, not very tall periodic table. It's not very good looking and it doesn't fit on pieces of paper very well. Whereas if you pull them out and create them as sort of um, a subsection below like that, they fit much better on a page and you can have your boxes a lot big, bigger and actually read the information in them. So as, um, my understanding is it's really just a formatting issue. It's got nothing to do with that needs. They're separate or anything like that. It's actually all just about fitting things on a page nicely. So that's why these guys are down the bottom. You, but like I said, if you want to put them in there, you can. You just end up with a very wide, uh, not very tall periodic table. And that means all the boxes are quite small. It's quite hard to read the information in. Now, generally, uh, what our periodic table is, is we actually don't order it by atomic weight anymore. And that's simply because we've come to know a little bit more about atoms and about isotopes. And so instead, we do it uh, based on the one thing that consistently is different between every single element. And the thing that is different between every single element or every single atom uh, of different elements is that they all have different numbers of protons. So hydrogen, if it's a hydrogen atom, will have one. No other element has one proton. Uh, if it is argon, it has 18 protons. No other element has 18 protons uh, by itself. Obviously, high level ones have 18 plus extra, but no other element has just 18 electrons. Um, as we would have mentioned in the other lesson, we know that our rows correspond to uh, electron shells. And so we now arrange our elements in left to right, top to bottom, in order of increasing atomic number. Atomic number is just the number of protons. So that's how we now arrange our table. Some of the information you can get from the periodic table, you can have a look at our two boxes up here. And you're going to have often the name, the full name, so hydrogen or helium written out. You're going to have the symbol. Now the symbol is just the letters that we use to represent that. So H for hydrogen, HE for helium. Remember every capital letter is the start of a new symbol. So if you have a capital C and a capital O, that's carbon and oxygen. But if you have a capital C and a little case O, that's actually cobalt. So it's really important to know what you're looking at there. Then you're going to have two numbers in your little box one of them is going to be a whole number one two three four five and that's your atomic number 
And the reason it's a whole number is because it's actually the number of protons in the atom. And you can't have half protons or quarter protons or anything like that. So the atomic number is always a whole number. All right. Um, and the other thing you need to remember is that they are electrically neutral because the number of protons, which are positive, is exactly the same as the number of electrons, which is negative. So the positive charge and the negative charge will completely counteract each other. Casting your mind back to last topic, if you remember when you lose or gain an electron, that's when that atom becomes charged. And when it becomes charged, we call it an ion. All right. So ions have electric charge. Uh, it'll be a positive ion if it loses electrons and it'll be a negative ion if it gains electrons. All right. Um, some other information. Uh, sometimes we might th see things written out like this with A, E, Z. Well, they won't say A, E, and Z. They're just placeholders. A will be the mass number. Uh, Z will be your atomic number. And E is the symbol. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, we just talked about symbols and we talked about atomic numbers, so we know what they are, but what on earth is a mass number? And, well, your mass number down here is... Basically, it's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if you want to know how much an atom weighs uh, of a different of a certain element, you look at how many protons does it have and you add that to how many neutrons it has. And that's going to tell you its mass number. Now, mass numbers can be different for different isotopes, and we'll talk about them in tick. But um, if you're looking at a periodic table, you might notice that sometimes the mass number, you might find its whole number, sometimes you've got decimals. But basically... There's a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, your mass number, with the exception really of hydrogen, is always going to be your bigger number. Um, okay, And that's because you've got protons plus neutrons. And because the atomic number is only neutrons, unless you don't have any neutrons, you can't, or you won't be lower even if you don't have neutrons, but you can't be lower because you've got to account for those protons, and that's what the atomic number is. So hopefully that made sense, but basically your mass number is always the bigger number. Now, the mass number might vary depending on what isotope you're talking about, but it's always going to be bigger than the atomic number. The only time that this doesn't fit is for one example of hydrogen where there is no neutrons, there's just one proton. And so in that case, you end up with an atomic number of one and a mass number of one. So that one just sort of doesn't really matter at all. But basically your mass number, you got to remember, is your protons plus neutrons. So if you have um, a mass number and you have an atomic number, you can work out how many neutrons there are. So for example, if I have an atom of carbon and it has a mass number of 13, carbon has uh, its atomic number is 6, so it has 6 protons. Uh, its mass number is 13. So I would go 13 minus 6, and that would leave me with 7, and 7 would be how many neutrons I would have for that example. All right, so a little bit more on atomic mass. Like I was saying, the mass of an atom is due to the number of protons and neutrons in it. But not all atoms of an element are exactly the same. You see, sometimes uh, you can have what we call different isotopes. Now, isotope comes from Greek. Iso means same, tope comes from the word topos, and it just means same place. And you're probably thinking, what do you mean same place? Well, isotopes are atoms, they're of the same element, but they have different uh, numbers of neutrons, so they have different mass numbers, but because they are actually the same element, they live in the same place on the periodic table. So if you have uh, what we call carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14, those are three different isotopes of carbon. Every single one of them is an atom of carbon because they, it has six protons. And so if you were to put them on the periodic table, they would all sit in the same place in the carbon place of the periodic table. But they have different mass numbers. And that's what an isotope is, really. It's an atom of the same element, but it has different numbers of neutrons and therefore different mass numbers. Um, what you might find, though, if looking at the periodic table, you're probably trying to work out, okay, I've got carbon-13, carbon-14, uh, and carbon-12. Which one of those numbers do I put on the periodic table for my mass number? Or do I take an average? And if you were to take the average of carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, you would get uh, 13. But if you look on the periodic table, the carbon mass number is much, much closer to 12. Uh, I'm looking at it here, and it's actually 12.011. So you're probably thinking, okay, well, it's a bit odd. If 13 is the average, why doesn't it say 13? And the reason for this is you want to take into consideration how much there actually is of that type of isotope. 
And carbon-13 and carbon-14 are a lot less common than carbon-12. Carbon-12 is what most carbon on Earth is. So if you were to go out and get a random sample of carbon, it's most likely going to be mostly carbon-12. And so if you wanted to do anything with it, you need to know mass number from it. You need to actually have a mass number that's going to most likely fit the sample you've got. And so we use what's called a weighted average. Um, another way of thinking about a weighted average is when your grade for uh, a subject is calculated. You probably know that, you know, an exam might be worth 30 percent, uh, a test might be worth 10 percent, an assignment might be worth 20 percent. Well, that's what we call different weightings. They contribute a different amount to the final score. And so really the abundance or how much there is of a different element means it has a different impact or a either a greater impact or a lesser impact on the final mass um, that we put in the periodic table. And that's what an iso uh, sorry, a weighted average for an isotope is. It's basically just an average that takes into consideration how abundant each isotope is. And that's why you have carbon on the periodic table has a mass, really, that's pretty much 12. Um, that's why nitrogen has one that's 14. Oxygen has one that's um, 16, pretty much. It's not because those are the only versions that exist of those elements but just because the isotope with that mass number is the one that's most common and so it's the one that contributes the most to the final mass amount all right uh, th there's an activity here it's uh, completing a worksheet if you do go and do this worksheet one thing you need to take into consideration and sorry you should be able to find the worksheet online um, is that the worksheet is written from an American perspective. So there's a point where it says um, one of our states or one of our coins, and it means an American state or Amer an American coin. So if you're going to go now and complete that worksheet, please just take that into consideration. Um, like I said, it's online. You should be able to find it um, on the unit page for this object. But I want to move now to talking about uh, patterns and trends in the periodic table. And we've already sort of mentioned that we see uh, patterns and, and that was a key part of actually how the periodic table was formed was this idea of repeating uh, patterns and trends. And so there's a whole bunch of things we want to look at. We want to look at what's the pattern with atomic number and mass? What are groups and families are happening there? What do we see happening with metals, non-metals, metalloids and, and how metallic things are? What about melting point? How reactive things are? What about atomic radius and electronegativity? So we're going to go over each of these and actually look at what happens in the periodic table as you move from one point to another. How do these sort of features and properties change? So atomic number and mass number are probably two of the easiest ones to do. As you read uh, from top to bottom, the atomic number increases. Now, if you think about it, this makes sense because on the periodic table, hydrogen is in the top left uh, and our largest uh, atom or element is in the bottom right. So as you're reading from top to bottom, the uh, atomic number, the number of protons is going to get bigger. Well, as you move left to right across a row, the same thing happens. The atomic number gets bigger. And that's because that's how we're reading. We read top, uh, sorry, left to right, top to bottom. And as we go that way, we're adding in protons. And so our atomic number is going to increase each time. Uh, as you add protons and probably neutrons as well, it happens to be that mass also increases. So as you move down a group, it increases. As you move left to right across a period, it also increases. Now, I have got a little bit of a warning there, just because sometimes when you're looking at something that shows relative atomic mass, where you're looking at that weighted average, uh, things can get a little bit wonky and you can get odd spots in the pattern. Uh, generally speaking, this is what happens, but sometimes you might have one uh, element where you go from one to the other and instead of going up, it goes down, but then it jumps back up again. This is very, very rare and only happens because we're looking at weighted averages and that how abundant a certain isotope can be can throw out the pattern. But like I said, very, 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 very rare. I think I've only seen it happen once. Uh, and that was a bit of an odd table anyway. So just a, just a warning, generally this doesn't happen. All right, next thing to talk about is groups. So there are eight groups or families in the periodic table. Um, the key five key ones that I'm interested in you knowing would be group one, which we call alkali metals. So these are lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Group two, which are right next to it, alkaline earth metals. So beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, uh, barium, and radium. 
all of these fit into alkaline earth metals. Uh, if you jump after group two, all the way from group three through to 12, uh, we have what we call the transition metals. So the first lot of transition metals would be uh, scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. Uh, and obviously going beneath them as well also with transition metals, but those are just some of the first ones. Uh, then if you jump all the way to the far side, um, or actually go from all the way on the right, and we'll talk about group 18, the furthest are your noble gases. So uh, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, um, and a new element that was only officially named in 2018, whose name I don't remember. Uh, those are your noble gases. If you move one in from the noble gases, you get group 17. These guys are known as halogens. And so that would be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, acetine, and again, another new element that uh, whose name I don't remember. So these are the five groups. I'm really interested in you guys knowing on the periodic table. Um, you can group other elements in different ways, but these are really the ones that we tend to talk about the most. And they have pretty um, clear features uh, between them for example noble gases are all inert they don't react with things whereas alkali metals are very violently reactive when you put them in contact with water uh, things like that so moving on we're now going to talk about metallic character um, and this is something we're interested in because elements basically fall into three categories they're either a metal uh, a non-metal or they're a bit weird and we call them a metalloid um, metalloids are just elements that depending on the circumstances, can behave either like a metal or they can behave like a non-metal. And so you can see here, this is just sort of where, uh, a snapshot of where in the periodic table that actually happens where we have this transition between metals and non-metals and you have the uh, metalloids in between there sort of as a, uh, a little zone where things are changing from one to another. Uh, I should add, not all periodic tables will actually have a dark line like that, so just be aware that you might need to find them yourself. <laughs> so you might be wondering, okay, well, what makes a metal a metal? You know, um, well, metals are solid at room temperature. Um, the exception to this is mercury. Um, you do have some metals like uh, gallium would be the other one I can think of where it has a very low melting temperature. Uh, you can hold it in your hand and it will melt. But at room temperature, which is tends to be more around what we consider 25 degrees Celsius, those ones are actually solid. Mercury is a weird one and it's not. So that would be our only exception. Otherwise, your metals are going to be solid. Metals have luster. This really means that you can polish them um, and buff them to a high shine and get them nice and shiny. Uh, something you can't do with non-metals. We'll get them later. Metals also happen to be good conductors of heat and electricity. When we look at metallic bonding, you'll actually see why this is. There's a really good reason why they can conduct heat and electricity and it has to do with how they bond. But that is something that they do and it's one of their properties that other uh, elements don't have, other elements like non-metals don't do. Metals are also malleable. This means you can mold them and reshape them. You can bend them and they don't necessarily break. Um, I know sometimes with some metals, if you bend them again and again and again, you can actually cause them to snap and break, but there's another process going on there. So generally though, metals are malleable. They're also ductile. Now this doesn't have anything to do with duct tapes or the ducts in your house or anything like that, or ducts that go quack. Ductile simply means that you can take a hunk of metal or whatever the substance is, and you can draw it out into a nice thin wire. That's what ductile actually means. So with metals, you can take them, you can turn them into lovely thin wires. And finally, uh, going sort of back to our first point actually, is that metals have high melting temperatures. And this is why most of them are solid at room temperature because they have such a high melting temperature. They're not actually going to be melted and liquid form or even gas form at room temperature. So those are some of the properties of metals. Non-metals on the other hand, unlike metals, they can actually be solid, liquid or gas at room temperature. So depending on what you're talking about, you might find them in uh, any one of those three forms. Some of their other properties, they're actually not shiny. Generally, uh, they don't have luster like metals do. They can't be polished to that high shine the same way. They don't bend nice and easily. They're quite brittle. So they can't, what we'd say is they can't bend. They're brittle. They break quite easily. Um, on the other hand, non-metals are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Uh, 
which is great if you actually want to use them to insulate against electricity or against heat. You can use them in that way because they don't conduct them well at all. They also tend to have a low melting temperature, and that goes back to why we can see them. Sometimes we do see them as solids, but it's why we see them as liquids or gases as well, because they have a low melting temperature. And since a lot of nonmetals are actually gases at room temperature, uh, for example, uh, oxygen is a gas at room temperature, helium, neon, these are all gases at room temperature. Uh, it's not to say that they can't be a liquid or they can't be a solid. Um, you can have liquid helium. It's used in the medical industry for cooling things like MRI machines. But it's something that you have to bring the temperature far, far below room temperature to actually get it to be liquid. So um, just like you have liquid nitrogen which is uh, very, very cool uh, in the terms of how fun it is to work with and actually in a temperature sense as well. So liquid nitrogen, nitrogen generally exists as a gas at room temperature. And if you cool it down far enough, you can get it as liquid. And we can do that. But if you've ever seen someone working with liquid nitrogen, you would see just how much insulation they have to have because it's so cold. It's very hard for us to work with because it's way, way below what we can actually stand. And we could damage and hurt ourselves if we come into contact with that liquid nitrogen. All right, moving on to metalloids, our uh, sort of odd category that's in the middle. It's a bit of a transition zone, a bit of a buffer between the two other categories. Metalloids are elements that share both metal and non-metal properties. You might find sometimes they behave more like a metal and sometimes behave more like a non-metal. Um, so eight metalloids that we're interested in would be boron, silicon, arsenic, germanium, antimony, polonium, acetine, and tellurium. Um, silicon's probably one that you're most familiar with because we use a lot of like silicon bakeware and that sort of thing nowadays. Or you can have uh, a spatula where the end silicon so it doesn't stick to anything while you're cooking and that sort of thing. Um, so silicon, when we look at it in that sense, we think very much of it as a non-metal. However, we can also use silicon in computer hardware um, and take advantage of the fact that it can also at times behave like a metal and that sort of thing. So silicon's one of those ones. That's, it's an odd one. It can behave both as a metal and as a non-metal. So that would make it a metalloid. Now, how metal or metal-like something is, we, that is its metallic character. And exactly what happens with metallic character and how uh, it changes uh, have a couple of specific patterns. So as you go from uh, top to bottom, moving down the group, elements become more metallic. So the ones at the bottom of a group uh, are more like a metal and show those metallic properties far more than the ones that are at the top of the group. On the other hand, as you move from left to right across the period, elements become less metallic. And that makes sense because on the left-hand side, we have metals, but on the right-hand side, we have non-metals. So as we go from left to right, we should become less metallic. So that's how metallic character changes as you move along the periodic table. The next thing to talk about is melting point. So what actually happens with melting point for different elements? Well, um, it's just one example of a physical property. So sometimes we might look at chemical properties. This is an example of a physical property. Um, as we go down, if you're in group one to five and you're going top to bottom, the elements melting point will decrease. So for groups one to five, the elements at the bottom have a lower melting temperature than the ones at the top. But from groups 15 to 18, the melting point increases as you move down. So what that means is uh, right at the top of groups 15 through to 18, they have higher melting temperatures than the ones at the bottom of groups 15 through to 18. So those two, you see two different patterns at either end of the periodic table. On the other hand, as we move from left to right with the melting point, melting points uh, will increase as you move initially from the left, so it goes up and then it comes back down. So you'd expect sort of around the middle to have the highest sort of melting point. All right, next point to look at, and this is a, a chemical property, is reactivity, how reactive these elements are. Now, if it is a metal, uh, and we're looking at groups of metals, as you move down that group, elements are going to become more reactive. Um, group one's a good example of this. So you've got lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, uh, cesium, and francium as we move down. So what that means uh, for this point is that lithium, yeah, it's reactive with water, 
But as I go down that list, they become more reactive until I get to francium. So francium should be significantly more reactive with water than lithium is and even more reactive than sodium or potassium is. And that's what we see. On the other hand, if it's a non-metal, the opposite happens. As you move down the group, they actually become less reactive. Uh, the halogens are a good example of that. So fluorine, uh, then chlorine, then bromine, iodine, acetate. As you're going down that list, fluorine is incredibly reactive. Uh, and what we would also say electronegative, it's really good at the, those sorts of reactions. But as you go down, it's not to say that they're not still reactive. They're just less reactive than the one above it. So that's what's happening as you're moving down groups. As you go left to right, so from um, group 1 all the way through to 18, and you're going across the period, elements actually start off being really reactive. That's what you see with the alkali metals, that group 1 group. Then it decreases. So around the middle, the, re um, the reactivity goes down. But then the reactivity starts going back up because remember, we're going to get towards the halogens, and the halogens are also very reactive. So we start with high reactivity. It decreases, then it starts to increase again. But then when it gets to that very last group, it all disappears because that last group is our noble gases and noble gases are inert. They're not reactive. So when we it goes from high, then down, then back up to not reactive at all. So that's a pattern we see with reactivity. All right, we're going to get into uh, a two, a bit more uh, detailed sort of patterns that we see. And this is atomic radius and electronegativity. Now, atomic radius atomic radius is simply the distance from the center of the nucleus all the way out to the furthest shell and that sort of thing. And that's the atomic radius. It's how big an atom's ra radius is. Now, every time you add a shell, you make that atom wider. And as you do that, uh, obviously the radius is actually going to get bigger. So if you look here in our diagram, we go lithium to sodium to potassium to rubidium to cesium, you can see they get bigger because each time you go down in that group, you're adding in a new shell and the atom itself gets wider. So as you move down a group, the atoms gain an extra shell, therefore it increases the radius. However, uh, even though as we move left to right, even though you're adding in electrons every time you move towards the right, you're not actually making the radius any bigger. This is because you're not adding a new shell. You're just adding stuff to the shell that's already there. It just so happens that as you do that, because you're also adding, um, you're, sorry, you're adding electrons, but you're actually adding protons to the nucleus. What you end up doing is creating a, a stronger and stronger positive charge in the center. And as that positive charge in the center increases, it starts to pull in those uh, electrons, those valence electrons in closer and closer. So you actually have a decrease as you go from left to right across the periodic table. And that's what you're seeing here. So it goes lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. But if you look at it, it gets narrower and narrower. And that's because um, even though fluorine has more electrons than lithium does, it also has more protons. And because it has more protons, it means there's a greater positive charge in the nucleus and it's pulling a lot harder on those outermost electrons. And so they're, they're getting pulled in a lot closer. And so you end up with a smaller uh, atomic radius. So as you go left to right, atomic radius gets smaller. As you go top to bottom, it gets bigger. Now, I've already mentioned this words, and you're probably wondering, well, what on earth is electronegativity? Well, electronegativity is just the ability of an atom uh, bonded to another atom to actually attract electrons towards itself. So some atoms are really good at pulling electrons towards itself. Other ones are really rubbish, and they get rid of electrons way too easily, and that sort of thing. So fluorine is actually your most electronegative. So you can see here in this, the higher the little column, the more electronegative it is. And fluorine is right up there. It's super electronegative. Basically, if an electron comes near fluorine, it's going to pull it right towards itself. On the other hand, something like lithium really isn't very electronegative at all. And that just means it's going to basically give up on its electrons. And so we've got sort of a flat version of that here. Uh, the bigger the number underneath the letter, the more electronegative it is. So electronegativity increases as you go left to right, and it actually increases as you go bottom to top. So if you were talking that the other way, if you, if you were going top to bottom, it would decrease. So the, that just means fluorine is the most electronegative because we're going up this way and up this way. We get stuck here at fluorine. Now, you might notice here in this raised diagram that uh, our noble gases are flat, and that's because they've really not got any electronegativity at all. Uh, and that's because they've got full outer shells. They don't need any more electrons. They're not trying to get rid of any electrons. They're perfectly happy as is. And 
the reason we're interested in electronegativity is it has some really interesting effects when we start talking about atoms and how they bond to each other. And there's something called a dipole moment. And this is basically if you take two uh, atoms with different electronegativities and you put them together at, as a molecule, how different their electronegativity is um, becomes the dipole moment. So if there's a really big difference, you get a really big dipole moment. If there's not very much, there's, a, there's not much of a dipole moment, if any at all. And so, for example, um, here we've got hydrogen and oxygen in this pink diagram down the bottom. And oxygen's a lot more electronegative than hydrogen. And what that means is oxygen's going to, any electrons that those two are sharing are going to live a lot closer to oxygen because it's going to pull it in a lot tighter than hydrogen is. And that just means that over the oxygen side, there's actually a slight negative charge, whereas over the hydrogen side, there's actually a slight hydrogen charge, uh, sorry, slight positive charge on the hydrogen. You can see that here with um, hydrogen chlorine and hydrochloric, the chlorine's more electronegative, so it pulls it towards itself. Water, which we think of as an electrically neutral compound, is overall. But if you look at the different areas on it, you'll find that near oxygen is actually slightly more negative because it has a greater electronegativity and you can pull those electrons in closer to it. And so if you have a molecule that has what we call a dipole moment, and I know it's a bit of a funny term, but it just means that it's got a difference in electronegativities. If it has this dipole moment, it's also what we call a polar covalent compound. Uh, we'll talk about what covalent means a little bit more when we talk about different types of bonding. But um, what this ends up meaning is it's something that can actually dissolve in water. So you can take hydrochloric acid because it's got that dipole moment and you can dissolve it in water. In fact, depending on that difference between electronegativity actually has an impact on the type of bond that gets formed. If you have a really big difference in electronegativity, anywhere from two up to four as a difference, then we get what's called an ionic bond. And the electron isn't actually shared at all. It actually gets completely transferred from one atom to another. If, on the other hand, the electronegativity is less than 0.4, we basically don't, this is not a polar molecule. It's what we call non-polar. And it's, it's all a covalent bond. The electrons are being shared between them, uh, but they're being pretty equally shared. There's no real pull from one side more than there is from the other. On the other hand, if that electronegativity difference is between 0.4 and 2, this is where we get what we were talking about before, those polar covalent molecules. These molecules that uh, the electrons are being shared, but they're not being shared equally. So some of them live closer to one atom than they do to another. And so this creates a really interesting uh, type of molecule because it does actually have an electric charge, even though overall it doesn't. And so it does slightly different things. So it says here, when the difference in electronegativity becomes very great, the bond is no longer what we call covalent or polar covalent, it becomes ionic. And in an ionic bond, the electrons are no longer considered shared between atoms ionic bond. The electrons are donated from atom to atom. So uh, it's really interesting that how difference uh, how big the difference is between the electronegativities of those two atoms actually has an impact on the type of bond that can be formed. Alrighty, so here's a bit of a summary of what we've been talking about. So uh, as you go down a group, atomic number and mass number increase. As you go across a period, they also increase. For atomic radius, as you go down a group, atomic radius increases. And as you go across a period, it decreases. With melting points, uh, it decreases for groups 1 to 15 as you're going down the group and increases for groups 15 to 18. On the other hand, if you're going across a period, generally what we see is an increase in melting temperature and then a decrease in it. Reactivity, we have uh, metals become more reactive as you go down the group, whereas non-metals become less reactive. As you go sort of left to right across a period, it starts off with really high reactivity. It decreases, then it increases again. But then when you get to group 18, you've got to remember that those ones are inert and they don't react. As you go down a group, we see metallic character increases. But as you go across a period, we see that that metallic character decreases. And again, that makes sense because like I was saying, you're going from um, the metals to the non-metals as you're going across a period. So that's a bit of a summary of all the points we've sort of been talking about here. Now, finally, I have an activity here for you. There should be a blank, uh, so black and white periodic table worksheet that you can get uh, off the unit page. And what you need to do is basically take all that information we've gone through and actually plot it out on a copy of the periodic table. So that involves, uh, as you can see here, first of all, uh, across the top, labeling groups 1 through to 18, uh, and then down the left side, labeling periods 1 through to 7. 
then uh, actually identifying the different groups so alkali metals alkali earth metals transition metals halogens and noble gases actually labeling them so it's nice and clear and then using three different colors to identify metals non-metals and metalloids so actually coloring it in and then using uh, a vertical and horizontal labeled arrows to show and explain what's happening with all these different sorts of properties you know what happens as you go down a group to atomic number of mass? What happens as you go across a period to the melting point? And so having all these filled in. So instead of this just being something where you've listened to a video or you've heard a teacher talk in class about what's happening with these different things, actually going through and labeling it on a periodic table so you can visually see what's happened. And so that's what you need to do now is to take all that information we've gone through and to actually put it down uh, on a piece of paper, on a periodic table so you can see what's happening. All right, well, that's the end of this. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this, and I hope you've uh, enjoyed it. Just remember, let your teacher know if there's anything you don't understand, uh, and you're welcome to rewatch this video. You, know, you can speed it up, slow it down, pause it, go back over a point you know, five times if you need to. Uh, but thank you for listening.